Good morning. The topic of today's lecture is why Qing China failed in modernization while Meiji Japan uh, succeeded. Uh, but before uh, I share my views uh, on the question, uh, I'd like to take a brief look uh, at um, uh, Qing China's decline uh, to provide uh, a perspective. Uh, Qing China reached its zenith during the reigns of uh, three emperors, uh, Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong. Uh, first of all, uh, China's territory uh, more than doubled. Uh, Manchuria, or the abode of Manchus, uh, was added. And uh, Taiwan was uh, uh, also uh, conquered and incorporated. Mongolia was conquered. And the eastern part of uh, Turkestan was conquered and incorporated as uh, uh, Xinjiang or New Territory, and the Tibet was also subjugated uh, before uh, uh, the Manchus conquered Tibet. Uh, it was uh, ruled by uh, Jungar tribe of uh, the Mongols. Take a look. The Manchuria. Uh, original Manchuria was uh, even larger than uh, today's Manchuria. Uh, the yellowish uh, colored uh, area was also part of uh, uh, the Manchuria. Uh, these areas were uh, ceded to uh, Russia uh, uh, in the 19th century. And uh, Xinjiang was also larger than uh, today's Xinjiang because uh, it included uh, uh, some uh, uh, area uh, to the west um, reaching uh, t uh, into today's uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan. So when you <clears throat> uh, add up uh, Uh, Mongolia was uh, added as the result uh, Manchus conquered uh, the uh, Manchus conquered uh, Mongolia uh, taking advantage of the uh, conflicts between Eastern Mongols and the Western Mongols. Actually, Eastern Mongols brought in the Manchus to uh, remove the threat of the uh, Western uh, Mongols. But anyway, by defeating the Western Mongols, uh, Qing China uh, expanded its territory. And um, Qing China also uh, conquered the eastern uh, Turkestan um, uh, and uh, named it uh, Xinjiang, a newly acquired territory. Uh, the original uh, Xinjiang was uh, even uh, larger than today's Xinjiang um, because it included some area uh, uh, reaching as far as today's uh, Kyrgyzstan. And uh, Tibet uh, was also uh, conquered. Um, in the case of uh, Taiwan, uh, 
Taiwan was uh, not a part of uh, China uh, un uh, until uh, uh, Ming uh, Dynasty. Uh, when uh, Manchus uh, uh, brought down the uh, Ming uh, Dynasty, uh, some uh, Ming loyalists tried to restore uh, the Ming Dynasty. Uh, one of the most famous uh, the, the Ming loyalists was uh, uh, Zheng Chenggong, uh, but uh, he was not successful um, uh, on, uh, on the mainland. So eventually he uh, uh, and his followers uh, fled to uh, Taiwan. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, well, Taiwan was inhabited by aboriginals and uh, uh, part of it was ruled by Dutch. Uh, Dutch built a fort uh, in today's uh, Tainan uh, area and um, uh, to exploit the natural resources of the island uh, offered, uh, Dutch uh, invited uh, Chinese, ethnic Chinese to uh, migrate to Taiwan. But um, uh, during the um, Dutch rule, uh, there were only uh, 50 uh, ethnic Chinese at the most. Uh, as the result of um, uh, defeating uh, uh, Zheng Chenggong, and uh, his followers, um, after uh, defeating uh, Zheng Chenggong and his uh, uh, followers, uh, Qing uh, China incorporated uh, uh, Taiwan as a prefecture of the Fujian uh, province. So. When you add up all these uh, uh, areas, territories, uh, uh, the total landmass uh, was uh, the, uh, larger than the uh, original uh, territory uh, ruled by uh, Ming China. And um, uh, China was a self-sufficient uh, agricultural economy. And uh, at that time, uh, Qing China also had a strong manufacturing sector for export products such as silk, cotton, tea, uh, and porcelain. And uh, at the turn of the 19th century, uh, Qing China was uh, the largest economy uh, in the world with the largest uh, uh, population. Uh, Qing China placed uh, strict uh, limits on uh, foreign traders. Uh, it restricted uh, uh, foreign trade to the uh, southern port of uh, Guangzhou or Canton. Um, Chinese had uh, little interest in importing goods from the West. Europeans wanted uh, silk, porcelain, tea, spices, uh, but uh, Chinese did not feel any need for trade. But there was one thing that uh, China wanted, silver. So um, it traded uh, with the uh, foreigners but only in the port city of Canton. And uh, Europeans are uh, paid uh, in silver for these items. As a result, uh, Europe, uh, European countries had a trade deficit, while uh, China had uh, a trade surplus. Trade surplus at that time meant uh, 
silver surplus. And um, silver uh, trade started uh, in the 16th century after Spain found a huge uh, silver mine in South America and uh, mined huge quantities of silver. Uh, that led to the first global uh, network of trade. Um, and uh, the Spanish silver flowed into uh, many different countries, but most European silver uh, ended up in Asian countries, in India or in, uh, in China. Uh, this is what, uh, um, a, what a Portuguese merchant wrote uh, back in uh, 1621. Silver wanders throughout all the world before flocking to China, where it is th uh, there, it stays as if uh, uh, at uh, its uh, natural center. So, uh, as long as So, uh, toward the um, uh, 18th century, when the British sent uh, a trade mission uh, to China, uh, Chelung Emperor could boast that uh, China has a large territory and abundant product. So, uh, basically, Chelung Emperor refused to set up uh, trade privileges with the uh, British. Uh, and um, still, uh, the British uh, traded with China and uh, demand for uh, Chinese tea uh, skyrocketed uh, back in uh, Europe. So England was importing more from China than it was exporting to China. So it had to spend a lot of silver on tea. Uh, and uh, British officials were worried about the trade uh, deficit. And they sought uh, uh, ways to improve their trade status uh, with China. Uh, finally, uh, uh, British, uh, British in the East India Company uh, decided to flood Chinese market with opium. Opium is highly addictive, uh, so um, uh, opium would create uh, eventually uh, uh, increasing uh, demand. Uh, the British exported uh, opium from India to China in exchange for silver. Uh, but uh, opium causes social problems in China. And uh, in addition to that, the uh, Chinese government was uh, afraid of a trade deficit, which means the uh, outflow of uh, silver. China demanded the opium uh, sales stop, but the British did not comply. So this led to the uh, opium uh, world. Opium imports to China from India uh, before and after the opium wars were to, the increase was dramatic. Huh? Huh? Well, uh, the, back in uh, 1773, only 1,000 chests were imported uh, to China, but uh, uh, um, 1829, uh, 18,000 chests were uh, exported to China. And uh, at the time of the uh, Opium War, uh, 40,000 chests were exported. To China. As I said, the opium uh, uh, had uh, caused many uh, social problems, 
and a very large percentage of men under 40 uh, became uh, opium addicts. And it also had uh, economic impact. Um, and uh, Chinese were uh, rightfully uh, resentful of England's uh, treatment of China because it sold a drug uh, uh, to the Chinese that uh, England itself uh, banned. And the Chinese government uh, outlawed opium, seized the shipments, um, burned them, and then uh, the executed uh, the Chinese uh, drug uh, dealers. And the uh, British demanded uh, free trade uh, of opium, and uh, China refused. Uh, and uh, that was um, uh, leading to a war uh, between uh, the British and the Chinese. Actually, British East India Com Company and the Qing uh, China. You may think that um, British was in favor of a war with China, but that is not uh, the case. Opposition to uh, risking a war uh, with Qing China uh, was uh, quite strong uh, in England. And um, well, opium trade may mean uh, a lot uh, to the some British merchants, but even in the East India Company uh, the trade volume, the China trade was not that uh, large. And um, um, many were reluctant uh, uh, and questioned uh, whether a war was worth uh, uh, worthwhile uh, the risk. And then uh, uh, some uh, opium merchants sent their uh, delegates uh, to uh, the parliament, and they succeeded in persuading the parliament uh, uh, to declare a war uh, against the Qing, uh, China. Um, you know the uh, outcome of the war. Uh, British uh, she sent a small force and uh, it was outnumbered by uh, Qing Chinese, but uh, uh, the British army was better trained and disciplined. So uh, British forces easily routed the uh, Qing defenders. According to one record I uh, read, well, one British company uh, succeeded in dispelling 50,000 strong um, uh, uh, Chinese uh, the army. Um, it was very simple. Um, most of the uh, soldiers were uh, uh, peasant conscripts. So as soon as the hostilities started, uh, uh, they began to uh, flee. Uh, that's why uh, British could easily uh, defeat uh, the Chinese uh, army. Um, Oftentimes, people uh, think uh, that um, uh, the outcome was determined by uh, uh, difference in the fire uh, power. But at that time, uh, the difference was not uh, that uh, large. Basically, um, Qing army used the same uh, rifle. Uh, Anyway, uh, as the result of the defeat in the Opium War, China was forced to sign an unequal treaty, uh, the Treaty of uh, uh, Nanking, 
uh, with Britain. And uh, over the next two decades, China had to sign similar treaties with France, United States, and uh, Russia. And slowly but surely, Qing Dynasty was losing control over China to uh, Western uh, intruders. Uh, the Treaty of Nanking was the first uh, of uh, unequal uh, treaties. China paid Britain 21 million silver tiles as a war cause uh, and in, uh, indemnity. It uh, opened five uh, uh, ports to trade in addition to Canton. And uh, the treaty also gave uh, extra territoriality to British uh, citizens in China. They were not subject to Chinese laws. And uh, uh, as the uh, result, Britain uh, received the island of Hong Kong and uh, a, the tip of uh, Kolong uh, Peninsula. Uh, right after the defeat uh, uh, in, uh, in the Opium War, uh, China was uh, uh, struck uh, internally by the Taiping Rebellion. Um, eventually, uh, the rebellion was subdued with the help of uh, foreigners uh, and the local uh, warlords. But um, the defeat of China uh, in the Opium War uh, and uh, the Taiping Rebellion um, resulted uh, in uh, uh, people questioning the uh, Manchu's uh, mandate to rule uh, the country. Um, so um, from the nine, uh, 1860s uh, until the 1890s, uh, Chinese began the so-called self-strengthening uh, movement. So basically, uh, uh, it was a modernization uh, project and initially, uh, supported by Empress Dowager uh, Cixi and the Imperial Court. Uh, it imported Western technologies and foreign teachers, set up factories to make modern weapons, developed shipyards, railroads, mining, and light industry, translated Western works on science government uh, economy. Uh, and the movement made some progress. Uh, but uh, very slow paced and uh, uh, but the outcome was uh, mixed and uh, uh, China's defeat in Sino uh, uh, Chinese War of 1894 uh, exposed uh, China's self-strengthening movement uh, was not uh, uh, good enough to secure China's uh, uh, in, uh, independence. Uh, uh, as the result of the defeat in Sino-Japanese War, China had to cede Taiwan uh, to Japan and uh, Manchuria, but uh, Manchuria was recovered uh, uh, by the th by three country intervention uh, put together by uh, uh, by the Russians. So uh, with the uh, Germany, France, and Russia intervening, uh, uh, Japanese uh, had to give up uh, Manchuria and. Um, that was one of the uh, groups uh, held by Japanese to, uh, 
uh, that uh, resulted uh, in the Russo-Japanese War of uh, 1905, uh, 04, uh, 10 years uh, uh, later. Yeah. And um, with the uh, China's military weakness uh, exposed, Western uh, nations forced China to make more uh, concessions, carving out uh, spheres of uh, influence along China's coast. Uh, and then, after the uh, uh, devastation of uh, the Sino-Japanese War, um, with the um, uh, help and encouragement of uh, uh, emperor, uh, reform uh, movement uh, uh, started. Uh, in 1898, uh, uh, known as the 100 Days of Reform, because uh, it was a short leave. Uh, uh, the 100 days, during the 100 days, uh, the reformers tried to change civil service examination and uh, make uh, the government more efficient uh, build a modern army and develop uh, mining, railroads, shipyards. But it was a really short lived. Uh, Empress Dowager uh, Chishi, believing that uh, these reforms will result uh, in weakening of uh, the imperial household and Qing dynasty, uh, she had uh, uh, stopped the uh, reforms. So that's uh, the uh, fate of uh, China's uh, modernization uh, efforts. Now uh, the, let's turn to uh, um, explanations. Well, there are the, there is no doubt. There is no dearth of uh, uh, explanations. No. Um, for China's failure. Well, the first uh, line of argument uh, lists um, uh, imperialism. The second uh, line of argument uh, lists uh, culture or religion. And the third um, line of uh, explanation can be broadly called class theories. And the uh, fourth line of arguments uh, emphasize the state of uh, failure. And uh, the arguments uh, run uh, in two ways. One is the pre predatory nature of the uh, Qing state. So the state was nipping the budding sprouts of capitalism. Uh, um, and uh, uh, if we turn to uh, Goshen Kron, uh, Nian explanation, well, the government uh, failed to play the role of developmental state. The Qing government failed to play developmental roles. Yeah. The, so these are the typical uh, explanations. And uh, uh, let me discuss um, uh, one by one. Well, differences in imperialist uh, encroachments uh, are listed um, uh, differences in imperialist uh, encroachment against uh, upon uh, upon uh, China and uh, Japan uh, are uh, uh, brought up uh, by many uh, to explore the different trajectory of uh, 
modernization in the two countries. Um, and indeed, it is true that uh, China faced uh, um, more uh, encroachment by uh, Western powers uh, than uh, Japan. Uh, well, uh, the, in the 19th century, um, because China was uh, attractive, many Western powers were interested in carving up uh, uh, Ch uh, China. But uh, in the case of Japan, the United States was virtually the only country that was interested in Japan. And uh, uh, even at that, the United States was interested in Japan uh, as a station where um, uh, the whaling uh, ships uh, could uh, uh, be supplied with the food, water, and coal. Huh? On top of that, soon after opening up uh, Japan, the United States was broiled in the Civil War. So uh, uh, it gave Japan some uh, breathing uh, space. I admit that there are some grains of truth uh, with the uh, imperialism uh, explanation, but um, I'm not uh, fully uh, uh, persuaded uh, because um, well, Japan was open, uh, opened up uh, in 1858 uh, and the Meiji Restoration took place in 1868. Uh, these 10 years were during these 10 years, uh, Japan is in, in a virtual state of a civil war uh, between the uh, Baku loyalists and uh, reformers challenging the uh, Baku. So uh, the country was in a state of a civil war. Still, after the restoration of uh, imperial authority, Japan succeeded in modernizing the country. If we recall what happened in Qing China, well, after the defeat of um, Taiping Rebellion, well, Chinese had uh, three decades uh, until the outbreak of a Sino-Japanese war. But as we can see in the result of the war china failed to modernize the uh, country as uh, much and as broadly as uh, japanese did so i'm not uh, wholly buying uh, this explanation well uh, Weber tried to explain China's uh, stagnation in terms of uh, uh, Confucian ethic, uh, uh, in contrast to Protestant ethic. As uh, you may know, uh, Max Weber was interested in explaining uh, the uniqueness of uh, Western European uh, countries. So um, to explain the Western, uh, Western European development, uh, he came up with the capitalist uh, spirit or capitalist um, uh, ethic. But uh, I'm uh, uh, suspicious of uh, this too. A waiver never uh, uh, visited China and uh, he knew China and India only through books and um, 
uh, to emphasize the uniqueness of uh, Western Europe, he wrote two books, Religion in China and Religion in India. Uh, so that was uh, the uh, sister uh, volumes, uh, those were sister volumes of uh, uh, Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Uh, um, as uh, we can see, Chinese were as capitalist as uh, the Europeans. Uh, it was uh, clearly shown after the uh, reform uh, started in 1978. So I'm suspicious of this. The remaining two explanations are more persuasive. Uh, that um, there is a line of argument uh, that uh, since there was no uh, feudalism in China, from the start, uh, China was a centralized bureaucratic state. So that's why China uh, could not uh, develop. Basically, this argument is based on European development experience. Yeah. Um, for those scholars, autonomy of merchant groups from political authorities, a, this, uh, which was a right gained with city charters in the medieval feudal uh, Europe, was a crucial factor in Europe's development. And of course, uh, feudalism also um, contributed to developing the notion of contract. But anyway, uh, those who subscribe to this view, Japan developed because uh, of its feudal tradition while China failed because of uh, uh, its bureaucratic uh, uh, tradition. But as I will show you, uh, shortly, I'm not fully agree with this kind of argument. The fourth um uh, okay, not fourth. So um um according to this view, centralized bureaucratic uh, Chinese government stifled the development of bourgeoisie, the development of commerce. First of all, uh, the state uh, forcibly controlled the commerce indirectly through um, uh, the um, service examination system, the state set, set standards of prestige and directed the aspiration of the able. Uh, the able. So um, uh, basically they argue that uh, in China, the merchant class became gentrified. Well, um, so um, a merchant uh, uh, family um, may raise uh, one of the, uh, the kids who's a bride to prepare for uh, service examination exam. And uh, they buy with the profits earned in commerce they buy lands and they become uh, gentry. Mm -hmm. um, but in Japan, in feudal Japan, Japanese uh, feudal state um, could not uh, prevent the rise of commerce and the development of uh, 
increasingly powerful and wealthy merchant bourgeois class. So in China, the centralized bureaucratic state stifled the development of a merchant class or bourgeois class. Um, that's why uh, China could not uh, 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 modernize. But uh, there are uh, some problems with these uh, earlier uh, explanation. Uh, some problems are factual. Uh, other problems are methodological. Okay, no bourgeoisie, no development thesis assumes a direct relationship between bourgeoisie and industrial capitalism. But this assumption is not borne out even in Western Europe, where there were more cities uh, in Germany than uh, in England. Yeah. And uh, These, these argument also assumes entrepreneurial merchant class. Uh, in later developing uh, uh, Europe and Japan, there was no entrepreneurial merchant class. They, okay, there was a merchant class, but they were not, uh, uh, these merchants were not uh, entrepreneurial uh, enough. So it was the state that prodded and encouraged the merchant class and helped them turn into entrepreneurs. Uh, thirdly, they assumed the class rigidity uh, in Japan is more apparent than uh, real. Of course, it's true uh, in Japan, uh, you could not uh, change your social status if you are Hakusho, if you are a common people, if you are peasant, you had to stay that way. If you are samurai, then uh, you cannot engage in uh, trade in uh, 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 artisanship, uh, or uh, you cannot be a farmer. Uh, you have to earn your life by serving your overlords, uh, receiving salaries. Um, but the difference uh, is uh, more uh, superficial. Uh, you could marry, in, okay, even if you uh, were a samurai, uh, you could become a merchant by marrying into a merchant class. Uh, merchant class. That was possible. The, so uh, the status uh, was not that uh, rigid as uh, uh, it um, appears at the first uh, uh, sight. The other uh, uh, problems are methodological. Actually, many of these uh, scholars who contrasted the Chinese and Japanese uh, experience did not compare the two countries directly. Uh, actually, they compared uh, the Chinese experience and Japanese experience with the uh, European experience. So they were, even if, so in the case of Japan, since it had, uh, it modernized, they were, scholars were trying to uh, find the similarities. In the case of China, they were searching for differences from the European uh, experience. So even though China and Japan may share many things together, share more uh, similarities than differences. Still, 
there, the differences may look uh, larger uh, than they actually are because of this indirect comparison. Um, so let me, uh, uh, and it, as a concrete example of the uh, uh, such explanations, let me take uh, Edwin, uh, uh, the example of Edwin Dreischauer. He published a uh, notable uh, paper back in uh, 1963. Um, he listed the differences between China and Japan. Yeah? Uh, well, from early on, uh, Japan has uh, had uh, a tradition of learning from abroad. Uh, on the other hand, as a center of believing itself, as a center of uh, civilization, uh, China was uh, complacent. So China was not uh, as eager as uh, um, Japanese to learn from uh, Westerners. And uh, he also noted the feudal decentralization in Japan against the bureaucratic centralization in China. This resulted in two things. One, because of a feudal division, Japan could uh, respond in a more diverse way to the Western learning and the Western uh, incursion. On the other end, uh, centralization prevented uh, such a flexibility uh, in China. And uh, in feudal Japan, classes or, or social status were compartmentalized. They could not uh, move from one class to another. So because of this, since you are stuck within your own social status, uh, those ableists uh, tried to uh, those able uh, list uh, uh, came to have a goal orientation. They tried to achieve uh, what they could within their own status. On the other hand, uh, in because of class fluidity and social mobility in China, uh, Chinese developed a, a uh, what he called status orientation. So they wanted to, to become gentle. So entrepreneurial uh, spirit was uh, not uh, uh, there uh, in comparison to Japan. Okay, uh, let's take a look uh, 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 each uh, item uh, of uh, <clears throat> Now uh, let's take a look uh, uh, how uh, the Reichshauer's arguments hold water against the facts. Uh, first, learning from abroad. It is true that uh, Japan was more ready to learn from abroad than China. 
uh, and for that matter, Korea. And um, uh, the so-called uh, Dutch learning or Rangaku was thriving in Japan. Uh, and uh, Japanese uh, tr uh, tried to Western technology and learning uh, through the Dutch. And uh, uh, so they even uh, translated uh, the international, a book of international uh, relations uh, uh, into uh, Japanese. And uh, the, such a, a Dutch learning contributed uh, a lot uh, to the modernization. That's true. Well, uh, in 1876, Japanese uh, acquired uh, uh, Ogasawara Islands. Well, even these days, by a uh, high-speed ferry, it takes uh, two days uh, uh, to reach Ogasawara Islands. It is in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, and the Japanese, uh, uh, during the Tokugawa Baku period, Japanese uh, uh, um, Japanese came to know the existence of the island. And uh, uh, other uh, the foreigners uh, were also uh, aware of the existence, but um, uh, the islands were not claimed by any other country. So as soon as Japan acquired a, um, a warship, uh, Japan, uh, with the foreign uh, the dip diplomats, uh, went there and claimed the island uh, as a no man's island. So it uh, the Ogasawara Islands became uh, uh, Japanese territory because of that because of that. And uh, after Meiji Restoration, uh, Japanese sent uh, a huge uh, 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 learning uh, mission uh, to uh, the United States and Europe. But the uh, Chinese uh, made the similar efforts. No? They, wanted, they wanted to learn uh, Western technologies. They tried to emulate uh, the uh, 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 the West, and uh, if we go back further in history, there were several instances of learning from outside. One good example is Manchu adoption of uh, uh, firearms. Uh, the Manchus were very quick in adopting uh, firearms. And the firearms were critical in defeating uh, the Western Mongols who rose up against the Manchus. And uh, the, the defeated uh, Western Mongols uh, migrated uh, to uh, uh, the Russian Empire and uh, they set up uh, their own community. Uh, uh, on the western bank of uh, Volga River, uh, which is uh, today's uh, Kalmyk Republic uh, in Russian Federation. Uh, anyway, uh, Japanese, uh, it was not Japanese alone. Uh, Chinese were uh, the also uh, the learning uh, from uh, abroad. Merchant class. It is true that the merchant class was thriving in Tokugawa, uh, Japan. Uh, uh, this, the development of uh, uh, merchant class in uh, Japan uh, owed much to the um, uh, alternate residence system adopted by uh, Tokugawa uh, Baku to secure political uh, stability. Uh, in the Tokugawa Baku, uh, during the Tokugawa, during the Tokugawa Baku period, the daimyos, the overlords of uh, the Han uh, or domains, uh, had to live half of the year in Tokyo, in today's Tokyo Edo, 
and uh, the other uh, six months in their own home. And uh, the Daimyo's families had to live in Tokyo. And they were uh, kind of uh, uh, hostages. But there were merchants in China too. How can you supply? How can you feed the whole country without the existence of the merchants? The rice produced uh, in the uh, Yangtze Valley had to be uh, brought up uh, uh, to the northern uh, area to feed the population. Was the Qing state an obstacle? It's true that the state was more predatory in China, but not fundamentally different from the Meiji state or fundamentally different from the state during the Tokugawa period. The Qing state also sponsored the pilot industrial plants, as we saw. Uh, it sent uh, students abroad to learn from uh, the West. Uh, it built modern schools. Uh, it built uh, the railways, etc., etc. Of course, um, that was not enough to modernize the country. But at this point, we have to ask why. Qing state could not do more than that. Here comes a, a very interesting uh, article written by Dwight Perkins, an economic historian uh, who taught at uh, Harvard. Uh, any, uh, his uh, the article is included uh, 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 in the uh, uh, in the assigned readings, he argues that the reputed official hostility to commerce has been greatly exaggerated. So he rejects Reichauer's distinction of a status-oriented Chinese and goal-oriented Japanese. Chinese did not lack the entrepreneurial spirit. And he questions the direct relationship between commercialization and industrialization. The fault of the Qing state, according to him, lay in failure to take uh, some intermediate steps such as capital formation and introduction of new technologies due to lack of financial resources. So he declares China's retarded industrialization was more a result of sins of omission than of commission. But Perkins, okay, so according to per, according to Perkins, the tax revenue of the Qing state was uh, about two percent of GDP, very very low. Hmm? That's why Qing state could not done could not have done more than it actually had. Uh, but Perkins stops here. He does not ask why the Qing state could not raise more revenues. To answer this question, I think we have to look at the 
problematic articulation between the state and the gentry in China. Well, the left side is the usual Western classification, state versus society. In Qing state, there was a very interesting class, gentry, between the imperial household, uh, imperial uh, state, uh, and the society. From early on, Chinese uh, empire, uh, the Chinese uh, imperial dynasties were high, highly bureaucratic uh, state. Uh, well, Qing state was among the most uh, bureaucratic centralized states of the time. And uh, the imperial rule needed the bureaucratic service of the upper echelon of the gentry class. Uh, gentry class. So gentry was part and parcel of the state created by patrimonial state. The state and the gentry depended on each other. Uh, the gentry was uh, dependent on the state for their status. And the uh, patrimonial state, the imperial household, needed uh, the service of the uh, bureaucratic service of the gentry class. So successful Gentry families bought the lands and became gentry. And uh, the state, imperial household, and the gentry had the conflicting and common interests. Well, as far as exploitation of uh, the uh, from the uh, working classes was concerned, they had shared uh, interests. But in distribution of uh, exploited the surplus, they were in competition. They tried to uh, increase their share uh, in the distribution of extracted surplus extracted from uh, working uh, classes. So both the imperial uh, household or the patrimonial state and the gentry had uh, stakes in the society, stakes in the system, imperial system. And uh, when uh, their stakes, imperial system was threatened, so both the gentry and the state had uh, a vested interest in the imperial system. And whenever, uh, when the, uh, when the imperial system was uh, threatened, uh, the, the reforms were given up. So why the reforms repeated were repeat, repeatedly failed in China. Why the reforms were repeatedly why the reforms uh, failed repeatedly in China? Well, reformers sometimes uh, the the reformers were scholars, intellectuals, or from reformers were uh, 
reformers in China, Qing China, uh, whether they were from the gentry class or uh, from the imperial household, were all stakeholders. So reform leadership had a vested interest in the existing imperial system. So whenever the imperial system itself was threatened, uh, the reforms were thwarted. This is in strong contrast to uh, Japan. In Japan, uh, from all on, samurais were separated from land since the time of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Lower samurais uh, in the remote Hans, who were the prime movers of Meiji restoration, had much to gain but little to lose by upturning the existing Baku system. And then, after uh, the and then in 1869, one year after the Meiji Restoration, there was a very significant uh, uh, incident uh, called Han Seki Hokan. Basically, it means the return of Han land records. Uh, that is also the tax records to the Meiji state. Uh, and the movement was led by Joshu. Uh, one of the uh, leading Hans uh, uh, in the Meiji Restoration. As the result, uh, the Meiji state came to have a solid financial uh, basis to make reforms to finance reforms. Um, a century later, uh, China began to uh, develop. So what, what's the difference? Well, we'll discuss uh, the, this topic uh, later on, but uh, uh, parasitic uh, class that had siphoned off state revenues were uh, eliminated. And um, well, after, uh, and there was a uh, new reform leadership uh, in power. And um, uh, because of the policy mix they um, adopted, um, China could finally solve the ma many problems that had pastured the uh, Qing state. On the one hand, there were market reforms. Uh, it, well, the reforms were not completely capitalist, but uh, and uh, secondly, one of the uh, problems of the Qing state was the lack of money. Well, uh, at the time of reform, um, China uh, also lacked uh, uh, financial resources. So basically, uh, China adopted uh, a system of physical decentralization it is also known as a fragmented authoritarianism. So basically, the central government delegated uh, uh, power, fiscal uh, authorities to the uh, provincial and uh, local government leadership. And as long as they could meet the goals, it didn't care. So, um, and uh, a portion of the profits were, were could be kept by uh, each level of government. So, um, 
these governments, local and provincial governments, uh, uh, basically tried to uh, achieve by mobilizing whatever uh, financial resources uh, uh, there were. Uh, so capital problem was solved that way. And uh, of course, uh, the China opened up. Thank you for your attention and uh, I'll see you next Tuesday.